gauntlet. It's a firewall. <laughs> Uh, all right, let's find out what map we're going to for the next game because these guys are ready to rock and roll. Cursed Hollow. King's Gambit is the one going for the map picks. That means first pick, first ban. Going to their opponents with no tomorrow. Okay. And, you know, I just want to reiterate, this is no tomb and no dragon in this series. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maps like Braxis and Volskaya that aren't necessarily as commonly favored can have some spicy cheese. And uh, I I'm curious. I think we're going to end up going there because oh, no. we will. <laughs> we will. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we will definitely go there. You know, no tomorrow. They have. They can play basically everything, so we yeah. can expect some pretty wild stuff if they are backed against the wall. And you know, uh, Kings Gambit. They're no. They're no different. Uh, they check out other regions. They're always studying. Mm -hmm. They know what's up. Yeah. They will have some some spicy stuff for us as well. But here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Game number two. No tomorrow with that first pick, first ban. Abathur is going to be the target here, going for one of the global options. Looking at the last series, we saw the Jaina Respect ban, and they go for the Maiev ban here. So when we look at King's Gambit, we mentioned this earlier. One thing they're very good with is Jaina, mm -hmm. but also the Garrosh to save it. And like, you know, it's it's like you said it perfectly earlier, the Garrosh is kind of like a support, often throwing the Jaina back to safety. Jaina doesn't have mobility on her own, so giving her tools like that allows for much more aggressive posturing than you might normally see, and it's super fun to watch. Yeah, I remember sometimes when I was watching E. Kevin on the Jane, I was like, you can't be there. You're not, you can't position He's up that far. I'm exactly, good. all of a sudden you just ice blocks, and it's like, okay, I get it, and then Garrosh shows up, tosses him over, like, Like, if you give good. King's Gambit, Malfurion, Jaina, Garrosh, like, the game's over. Yeah, no, I, I totally but, agree. Like, they'll body you with it. So, you know, we do see the Abbot Maya. I wouldn't be too surprised to see the first pick on Garrosh. Jin is very good on the hero as well. Mm -hmm. uh, could see that here. What are you thinking? I think Garrosh does look good, but no tomorrow they're considering it right now. Uh, and, and yeah, so it, I think it's a fantastic first pick because we, we were discussing this yesterday, but having that aggressive um, initiation style warrior, either in the Garrosh or the Diablo, I think is actually very important in these series because it generates so much momentum during the early game and and that's why i loved seeing the diablo as the response last game from game mm. but we see the etc locked in you know this is a big map uh so potentially could elect to choose you know stage dive at level 10. very true um and i, I also just want to like mention that there's no hesitation there they like pre plan this out. They said, if they grab Garrosh, we're getting Hanzo in ETC. And, you know, their willingness to, to rip that arrow, as you mentioned, with Hanzo is something that we're going to see constantly. That's their a huge form of engage. ETC brings in that global control that they feel they might need. It's also forces them, allows them to just avoid the Haka or ban the Haka here. Mm, good points. Really good points. We got the Genji. It's the brothers against each other. Brothers. Yeah. Malfurion as well. Likely Stukov. Um, actually, not likely. There's a chance that uh, Stukov gets banned out during this phase, but mm. King's Gambit, they're considering it, uh, considering what to ban at this point. Uh, they need a solo laner. Yeah, so it's the Hawka banned out. So yeah, high chance that ETC gets selected as this global style hero. Yep. King's Gambit, maybe, you know, maybe pretty they keep him normal. I don't know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's just the mentality, right? Because... Yep. Um, if there's Genji, you don't want false head. They probably anticipated this as a, a likely situation and uh, just, you know, decided ahead of time, we're not playing false head again. It worked out great Sky Temple. Uh, very different scenario, though, draft-wise. So King's Gambit. What's their support of choice? Probably Rengar, um, yeah. if, uh, if I had to guess. Yeah, you know, you're playing against the Garrosh and the Malfurion, so that could be likely. Um, we've actually seen some Alex Straza show up on Curse Hollow, so that's True. a possibility. Uh, Lucio also in there, in the mix, if you will. Yeah, but if Lucio gets flipped, it's it's a uh, it's tough. That's true. Um, okay. Tyrion and Sonya, they're gonna leave it responsive. I like leaving their support for last, but this is triple warrior. How do you feel about that? It's something that we see King's Gambit do, but not a lot of teams. Uh, no, tomorrow have to pick something like a Tychus here, or s something that's going to be able to do something to these warriors because uh, Genji is not the hero to deal with the Sonya, Tyrion, and ETC. You know, Genji's got his eyes on Hanzo. But yeah, I think that they need to definitely either choose a Leoric as their offlaner or something like a Tychus that can actually deal with them. I don't think Blaze is really the response either. So actually, maybe it is. This is kind of weird, okay. but at times we've seen things like Judgment and Leap paired together in weird games like this. So I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's, it's not something that some of our top Open Division teams have never done before. Uh, and 
I don't. I just love the fact that that's always a threat, right? So they do go for the the stability of Blaze, which makes perfect sense to have the bunker to balance against that sanctification, and then Greyman. So I was thinking Blaze might be a bit of a mistake, uh, but no, I absolutely see the the value in it here. In fact, I'm not even sure why I said that. Blaze makes the most amount of sense. You know, you get so much value from the jet propulsion against those three targets that are in an area like that. Cursed Hollow, his stall potential is fantastic. Um, so I actually do really like the Blaze pickup. And then Greymane also kind of satisfies that condition of the anti-warrior in the Cursed Bullet. He does, but not as there's much. one warrior you can hit with Cursed Bullet. And you've got three warriors, basically four with Uther, because, I mean, Uther's bringing more CC to the table. This is a, we're just going to walk at you composition. We have the dragon arrow to engage. We have other fantastic engage tools, control tools in the form of holy ground, which is insane on this map, by the way, because of this, the choke points that exist. So this King's Gambit draft is completely different style than last game. So is no tomorrow's, but I'm just so glad to see this team come in here and just look like, okay, we're just going to completely shift our tempo. You know, I'm kind of in the same boat where I'm like, I feel like this is pretty 50-50 in terms uh, of oh draft. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, I like the fact that Tyrael is so good on this map for controlling bosses. So maybe we will see fights evolve over the boss pit. That's Holy true. ground. Yeah. No, that's absolutely something we have to consider on this matchup here. Guys, let's get going into game number two. King's Gambit with a great start, but no tomorrow is no slouch. We're going to find out who can take it here on Cursed Hollow. On the blue hand side, it's No Tomorrow down 0-1. Jay Shrite is loading on in, playing the Greyman. We've got Thompson on support. Jin gonna be our tank on Garrosh. Casanova rolling in, playing the Genji, and Equinox rounding up the team with that off lane of Blaze. And on the right, in red, up one game is King's Gambit. We've got Diesel on ETC, Dropless playing the Hanzo, E Kevin on Tyrael, E Toby on that Uther, and Zergling playing the Sonya. You know, when you look at this team of King's Gambit, there's, it's such an interesting team because, you know, in HGC Open Division, we have a lot of players that, you know, have been in HGC Pro. You look at guys like Tiger JK or Talking Trees, uh, you know, from XD and all different all these names that we've seen for a long time. And it's kind of a different story. Like, yeah, we know E. Kevin and E. Toby from Heroes of the Dorm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, that's next week. That's hype. Uh, but we also have just like, you know, n a lot of new blood here. And it's so... That's what Open Division's all about, right? And yep. it, it makes me so happy. I wondered if we're going to see a little bit of a mentality shift in No Tomorrow right now. Diesel on this ETC, he's hard anchoring bottom side, looking, waiting for Jayshwit to show up. This, the follow-up will be there with Uther's stun, but uh, Casanova recognizing this aggressive play from King's Gambit's bottom lane, and they rotate down with Jin, but not able to find anything. Good juke for me, Toby, to just evade the garage and... Uh, Passively walk back to safety. So they force the rotation. You know, no big deal. They're going to go start their first giant camp a little bit before Jay Shirtay can get to the giant camp with Greymane on the blue side. It'll give them a slight edge in the ability to look for other opportunities. Potentially, uh, in some situations like this, we've seen invades on uh, night camps. If you think you have the edge and information and control of your heroes' rotations, and they do have four members currently postured in that bottom half of the map. First objective, spawning bottom side. So no tomorrow with their siege camp top. Technically can get a little bit more value if they play this one properly. And it looks like the rotations from no tomorrow are coming out top side to try to get a little bit of damage onto Zergling. Can this be a kill though? Zergling a little bit caught out. The jet propulsion does land. The slows are going to be there. The spin to win and Zergling Ooh. narrowly oh. escaping death. Wow, um, it doesn't get closer than that, folks, but we do see Zergling slipping away. Uh, fortunately for them, they currently have two members postured at that night camp, so they could send one up to the top in the form of Tyrael if they so choose to do that for the Soak. Make sure they don't miss any experience here. He also needs to be there to help clean up that night, or the giant camp that is pushing in. Night camp in mid, we'll see if they can get any value with that as it is well ahead of their opponents who are just now getting started on cleaning that up with the Malkyrian and Greyman. Half of that minion wave, too, missed for King's Gambit in the top lane. So we're seeing just a, a slight experience lead for No Tomorrow. Also, the tower going over. Um, so nothing nothing crazy, right? But King's Gambit, they have this Tyrael, this, this, uh, this shield mm -hmm. in the Justice for All, pushing mid. Jin actually not able to find that uh, the Wrecking Ball onto a hero. So lots of push from King's Gambit here. Yeah, he looked for it. Uh, it was close. But King's Gambit will be able to get uh, almost both towers down in the mid lane. And when it comes to a night camp push, 
you know, that's what you want to do with Tyrael, get the full effectiveness, trying to get that experience uh, back. You know, you mentioned some of the XP that was lost. It does help bring them back to an even state. Power slide in, that's going to seclude Jin. They also have the Tyrael going forward. So many tanks in the front, but the damage focus onto Diesel. ETC getting very low. Heal's coming through from Uther, but he only has the single target heal for that moment. Uh, does he have the W available anytime soon? Diesel tossed in, he's done so. That's going to be the single kill. First blood of the game going to the side of No Tomorrow and Itobi looking to be the second. That was very ambitious of King's Gambit. One, I actually thought that their positioning there was fantastic. They cut off the rotations from No Tomorrow into the bottom section of the map where they probably could have very realistically stepped up and got the first tribute. Tomster getting some damage done from Zergaming, but going to be able to walk away. But instead, they actually force a fight there and they get in a lot of trouble. Kevin? Ruins is available and Kevin will be able to back away. We do have Sony still battling out with Tomster and Malpurian in the bottom. Uh, but mid fort going down quick. Huge win for No Tomorrow. Yeah. King's Gambit need to be careful because they have like this weird style of comp. You know, they want to be grouped up because of the Sonya and the Tyrael. But also, if you're grouped up so far, that just means that Malfurion is going to get so much more value from the Moonfire. Malfurion getting, you know, constant ticks, huge heals. You got Blaze, yep. you know, with the fire just constantly damaging you. A lot of things that are the cleave of even Greymin, Gillian Cocktails, it all adds up. Yep. No Tomorrow looking a lot more clean so far this game. Casa going to get a little bit of chunk out, mm. but no, no power more slide, mobility. I guess. Yeah. Or maybe he wasn't uh, around the wall you know, quick enough to get the padding for that interrupt or that stun, which would have been nice for them. It ruins to stun here. It does make Tyrael kind of vulnerable. Got to be careful from the Garrosh in that moment. Tossed it not to Diesel this time. As Thompson's going to get the Oh, no. Uh, nice arrows poking through from Hanzo, getting the interrupt to keep this uh, at bay. Sonya just now rotating after soaking the lane, but it looks like they're going to concede their positioning here. Just give it up. 2-0 lead on the tributes for No Tomorrow right now. Lots of momentum for No Tomorrow at this point. Two tributes for them, one level lead, uh, and they did an excellent job right there just zoning out. We saw Jin just stepping up into that pixel bush, making sure that the members of King Gambit couldn't move forward and uh, stall the cap with Hanzo. So nice job by No Tomorrow there. They're actually, considering the circumstances, yep. substantially in the lead. Uh, how do you feel about level 10, though? Is this like uh, we're just going like, to pop Tranquility and be able to live through their, their like low damage team? And is that going to be a huge issue for King's Gambit? I think it could be. 13 and 16 are really the, the big question marks for me when it comes to King's Gambit. Because, you know, as the game progresses, Sony gets harder and harder to kill. And, of course, it, it's likely going to be a de-shield as well from the Uther. You know, the shielding and sanctifications from the, the Tyrael. You'll have the global effect in this ETC. So King's Gambit, uh, their composition certainly comes online post 10, but no tomorrows is nothing to shake a stick at. I'm so curious what Heroic's going to look like for King's Gambit personally. Uh, even just like, you know, the Divine Mosh is like a huge enticing thing, but do they have the meaningful damage to, to actually make it look amazing? Uh, I don't know. Uh, when you run Triple Warrior, it really changes the dynamic quite a bit. Jin Whoa. is going to be able to scout this out as a very ambitious boss considering there's no level 10 for two level disadvantage. And honestly, um, they just don't care. They're willing to fight uh, over a boss right now. Jin being the focal point as they're trying to get the focus onto him. Droplet's doing a lot of damage. Bunker has been dropped. Twilight Dream does, or, uh, does end up going down here. Genji popping the Dragon Blade. So many juicy targets. The shields from Tyrael, just not enough. And yes, they deny the boss from being picked up, but they pay dearly. Oh! Two heroes surviving with absolutely no HP so far in this game. So that's the trade. Kassa and Zergling, you know, and Sonya surviving that early game gank. But right here, I, I do think that, you know, King's Gambit, they have been playing ambitiously, but this was just too far. You know, the, the risk reward from contesting this boss was just way too much. With top pushing into, you know, they could have just cleared top lane. They could have cleared bottom lane and even mid. Uh, but instead, they contest this boss and yeah. they pay dearly for it. They're still level 8 while their opponents have hit 11 and are about to have a curse that you cannot contest because instead of soaking and getting your level 10 and catching up and finding other safe options, you basically took a really risky fight that could snowball out of control. Yep. Um, it's not over yet because I think their 10 is going to be really strong. And, you know, that fight just went too good for No Tomorrow considering they had heroics. It's the scary part, man, when you're fighting into those heroics and you don't have any for yourself, especially playing into, you know, the radius of taunt yeah. in those close quarters. It can be really sketchy, but... It's a really good point. No Tomorrow rotating mid with their curse here. First one of the game. They're looking to pick up this keep wall in the mid lane. Bottom fort will be picked up from just the minions crashing in as well. And this experience deficit is getting greater and greater. 
Yeah, I mean, the curse is really going to press the issue to an extreme. Uh, Two-level deficit is, like, and not the key. end of the world. We we saw them, you know, come back from two-level deficit last game. Uh, but, yeah, losing a keep this early in Cursed Hollow, not the best thing. They're so close to their heroics, they just do not have them locked in. Big damage onto e Kevin. The Jet Propulsion confirming that kill for the team. And, yes, he's going to try to get some value out of his trait. But no Tyrael. Level 10 now being reached. We do see Moshpit and Divine Shield are locked in. Pretty cl classic heroics. The engage with the arrow is decent. Can they get the focus onto Equinox or anyone? No. Divine Shield, Shield forced to be used here onto the ETC to back away. The keep's still standing. Tyrael up in two seconds. All they want to do is keep this keep alive. That was actually a very good defense from King's Gambit. A lot of focus went onto the Tyrael at one point instead of just focusing on keep. So no tomorrow. They walk away from that one, not picking up the keep in what looked like a situation where they could have taken it almost for free. Very, very clean decision making here though. Grabbing the Giants so that there's no option to cleanly push out the bottom lane and immediately going to the boss. But we see the, the response from King's Gambit. They're gonna go do their boss as well and they should be perfectly safe in doing this. So they're getting a small win. They're still very much in the back foot. Yep, definitely. It's good that you mentioned this is a small win because absolutely, you know, these trades in uh, bosses for King's Gambit is something that you want when you're behind in the game. Uh, both uh, No Tomorrows, though, worth mentioning is the fact that it will be on this bottom side of the map. And if King's Gambit don't rotate in with their never outmatched Hanzo, Hanzo, sorry, uh, it could take a keep, but likely not. Actually, maybe. They're all going to commit. Hurts. This, this could be hurts. huge. Yeah, yeah this is... Um you know, maybe they should have left one person in this bottom lane. Giants completely opening up the lane with the boss coming. Yes, they are willing to siege with a boss and Giants. Absolutely. Also, the talent here advantage flipped in. Easy DC has to spend the cleanse uh -oh. in the situation. Divine or sanctification goes out. Uh, this time for E. Kevin to stay alive, but that monster resource of the sanctification pretty much means they can't fight. They just do not have the power. That's a lot of tools, and now the 13s, obviously here for no tomorrow, they're going to be able to push in, and if any members of King's Gambit die or they, they don't win this fight, like they could lose the game. No tomorrow. Pressing the issue, the snap kill on Deterial as the Dragon Blade is tearing through everyone. Low is, is Genji, however, the Mosh Pit helping pick up that kill. Now the focus on Blaze. Equinox is very low, but so is ETC. Down he goes. Equinox, living, Zergling, however, will not be as lucky. Boss has expired, but just droplets in Toby versus the four-man push. Giants behind this. The core is falling rapidly, Kala. Yeah, this is very, very strong push from No Tomorrow. Material is back up, but the members of No Tomorrow, they're on this core. They're looking to pick up their game in a Oh, manner that looked oh like Supreme Vengeance here. 2% and that is it. A quick 11 minute game coming in for No Tomorrow. They just looked so ready for everything thrown oh, yeah. at them. And right out of the gates too, you know, they, uh, it, to me the big part was that fight where... The um, boss fight? Before that even, where um, where King's Gambit, they, they had that uh, mid-bottom bush taken and then they fought into that choke even though they had actually the, the rotation completely cut off so yeah. they could have taken the first tribute likely for free there, but they take the fight instead, they lose it, they lose that tribute, they lose the next tribute, and then they fight 8 to 10 on the boss pit. That was, yeah, absolutely uh, kind of the nail in the coffin. And it's interesting because they they actually got Garrosh down to about 10% HP, right? You know, if the Hanzo was able to get a little bit of a better leap over, he jumped over the, the walls, and it, his DPS was basically cut off for two seconds. During that two-second phase, um, he could not get in to get the final hits for the team. He's so, mm -hmm. you know, you're so reliant on that. You kill Garrosh there in that situation, maybe it works out, right? Maybe Taunt doesn't get the monster value. Maybe the Dragon Blade isn't too much for your team to get through. I don't know. Uh, obviously, they knew what they were doing. They knew that there was no 10. They were going to try to sandwich around the boss and force the issue. And I'm all down for creative play, but is this the time to do it in the Crucible when, you know, it's literally the biggest match your team's ever played? Maybe. I mean, you had the never outmatched Hanzo. I think you can just give that boss completely and then just kill it. Yeah. It's not not the end of the world. If you're a King's Gambit, you're just saying all I want is level 10. That's kind of where our comp comes right. online. It was a it was an all or nothing style of of comp, you know, it was mosh pit, not the stage dive. So they needed to get those arrows, get those mosh pits. And and they really their comp just didn't have the momentum to come online because No Tomorrow recognized that their win conditions were a little bit later than their own and they pressed their advantages and they absolutely dominated in this game. I, I do have to say though, like it is as Rough as that looked for King's Gambit, I love the the way that they're approaching the game. Like, fight. Yep. Just just fight us. Just fight us right now. We are going to beat you mechanically in the team fight. And that seems to be their mentality. Like, we will just outright outplay you. And in the long run, I mean, that looked fantastic for them in game one. Uh, game two, 
Didn't work out, but it's a best of seven, guys. We're going to get ready for our third game of the series. Stay tuned. We'll be back in just a few.